Hello, everyone. Karen's here with Climate Agents, Agents of Change. I am a climate educator and a librarian. And what I'm doing today are Climate Bites. Climate Bites are little snippets of information that you can present at city council or uh, to your friends and neighbors, um, anywhere that uh, <laughs> anywhere that decisions are being made that affect the environment in your local area or on a global scale. You can put out this information uh, because it's verified, it's factual, and there's a lot of disinformation out there that needs countered. People would counter it if they knew for sure, if they uh, were more grounded in, in the truth of, of climate science, um, and even if they understood how science works, which a lot of us think we do, but we don't really. So let's look at um, climate bites. So the first question, how do we know it's us? How do we know the climate, that the warming that we are seeing uh, if the average global temperature of the planet, the warming that we are seeing, how do we know that it's due to human, <clears throat> human activity? So multiple lines of evidence show that human emissions from the burning of fossil fuels are the source of the excess carbon dioxide. The excess carbon dioxide is causing our planet's temperature to rise. These multiple lines of evidence include information gathered from satellites, from ice core samples, from tree rings, from meticulous historical temperature records, and aggregations of vast amounts of data collected from thousands of monitoring sites on and above and beneath the surface of our planet. So just as a detective would investigate every cause of warming and rule out one by one by one which is not the cause this time around so yes surely uh, earth's orbit earth's tilt earth's wobble all of those things are called milankovitch cycles those have impacted earth's climate in the past um and scientists are you know ast astrophysics and astronomy are, are very well developed fields I would say for Homo sapiens, that's, that's probably our, one of our pinnacles of scientific achievement, one of the fields that we are actually the best in. And <clears throat> I would, um, so, so we need to know that um, by natural cycles, by Milankovitch cycles, we would normally be in a cooling phase. So we look at what are the causes of Earth's climate and how do we rule them out? How do we know what's not the cause? Um, and scientists have done that uh, until they've arrived at the conclusion that the only cause left is human activity and the enormous amounts of excess carbon dioxide that the burning of fossil fuels has put into Earth's atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> so let's, uh, that, is, that was one climate bite and I should have kept it short instead of improvising about it. I'll try the next one without improvising, all right? So if someone asks you, could it be natural cycles making Earth warm? Well, the natural cycles which drive climate are Earth's orbit. So eccentricity refers to the shape of Earth's orbit. The wobble is the actual axial precession. So the wobble is sort of like Think of the tip of a top when you spin it on the, on the table. Uh, the top goes around in a little circle and that's Earth's wobble. And then the tilt is called obliquity. So the uh, wobble, the tilt, and the shape of the orbit from either rounder or ellip more elliptical changes over thousands and thousands of years, these cycles. But these are the cycles that have impacted Earth's climate in the past. So astronomy is a highly developed science, extremely accurate, and these cycles are well understood patterns. And 
Did you know that according to where we are now in space, Earth would normally be slightly cooling at this time? So the reality of the warming is exactly the opposite of natural cycles. Because humans have changed the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere enough to overcome the power of the natural cycles. So if anyone says to you, it's natural cycles, say to them, what does cause Earth's climate? What are those causes? And by those causes, we can see that what we are, the warming we are seeing is exactly the opposite of those cycles. It's anything but natural. It is human activity, uh, specifically the burning of fossil fuels. Okay, climate bite number three. Why must we stop burning fossil fuels? We humans would have had a Goldilocks planet, not too hot, not too cold, for another 10,000 years. But 30 gigatons, that's 30 billion tons of excess carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere every year, has catapulted us into an entirely different climate condition. The more emissions we continually add to the problem every day, the harder it will be for any action to be effective. That's why we must leave it in the ground. No more fossil fuel expansion. Why do climate advocates say that we have less than 10 years? Well, take a block of ice out of an ice box and set it on the kitchen table. If you are not in control of all the factors in that room, then you might not be able to tell exactly when it will melt. But you can guarantee that at some point it will be melted. Well, the poles are Earth's icebox. If Earth's temperature warms plus 1.5 degrees Celsius above the baseline of pre-industrial levels. So let's say that again. If Earth's temperature warms, plus 1.5 degrees, in other words, just 1.5 degrees Celsius above the baseline of pre-industrial levels, then conditions will be in place for the poles to melt. Because that condition around that ice cube has changed, right? When it was in the ice box, the condition around it kept it frozen. But when you set it on the table, the conditions around it are guaranteeing that at some point it's going to be melted. Having those inevitable, inevitable conditions in place is what we must avoid at all cost because it's irreversible. And this is the important point. Civilization is not compatible with an ice-free Arctic. Tipping points are being breached earlier than anyone expected. I care about passing the beautiful advancements of civilization onward. That's why action at scale and speed is necessary now. And that's why we should not be so concerned with arguing about whether we think an ice-free Arctic or a blue ocean event is what uh, when all the ice is melted off the ocean. Whether that's going to happen sooner or later, in five years or in 30 years, because we need to be concerned with setting conditions in place that will make that inevitable. So that's what we need to focus on, are what, what inputs are we putting into the system right now that are changing those conditions? and putting the conditions in place for the Arctic to melt. <clears throat> so why does everybody need to understand parts per million? Well, parts per million of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere is a measure of our planet's ability to sustain human life and civilization. It reflects Earth's life support system for the things that we humans care about and need.
Now, the entire time human beings have been on planet Earth, the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was under 300. Just picture a timeline reaching back or picture a, a rope going back 100 feet. And that's the whole time humans have been on the planet. Everything you remember from history the pyramids, the Great Wall, Alexander the Great, the Baroque composers, uh, the artists, so <clears throat> uh, different wars, the Revolutionary War even, uh, even the Civil War, all of that history before 1900 happened to human beings living under 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere. So whoever in your family who was born in 1900, think back, you know some ancestor of yours in your family was born close to 1900. And that person was the last generation of humans ever to live under 300 parts per million. If you are a mature adult today, then it was already up to 310 when you were born. And if you are a 30-year-old, it was 350 when you were born. Scientists tell us 350 parts per million is the highest safe limit. But fossil fuel emissions have been accelerating for the past 30 years. Now we're at 420 parts per million and climbing. This change is in the chemical composition of Earth's atmosphere occurred over just the last six generations of human beings. It is happening now throughout the lives of your parents, children, and grandchildren. It is happening on our watch. So these are just a few of my climate bites. That means that these are things that you could stand up and read at a city council. You could educate your elected representatives with these. You can take one at a time. The, the longest one is just a few paragraphs. So you could use that and um, you could publish them in the newspaper. You could put them on your blog or your Facebook page or your Instagram. You are welcome to share them because they're, it's very important that people understand these key concepts. And they understand... Um, I think when people understand more, we just will have a much more peaceful time of doing what we need to do. I think that people will pull together once they really understand. They will say, you know, we faced huge challenges in the past as human beings on planet Earth. And now it's time for us to rise together and face this challenge as well together. Not as separate individuals, just... Um, trying to be in a prepper or be in a, you know, trying to survive on our own stockpile canned goods in our basement or something. Um, it's much better to reach out and form a neighborhood network to say, how are we going to help each other? And I believe people will do that when they start to understand what's at stake and how close we are to some really serious social problems happening in our communities. I think that people will step up and realize that we don't have to let this happen and we can preserve enough of a civilizational structure so that the scientists of the future will have a place to stand. They'll have a place to work from They'll still have computers and labs that aren't flooded and universities and the things that they need to hopefully uh, innovate something that we haven't dreamed of yet that will help. Because right now, the generation that's alive today is responsible for stopping the use of fossil fuels so that those other things will be available for them to be able to innovate and hopefully clean up some of the mess we've left them. So <laughs> raise your children with some um, courage and heroism because that's what's called for right now. 
Thank you. This has been Climate Agents, Agents of Change. <laughs>